Welcome to the webinar, Managing Complex Wounds with Major Soft Tissue Loss. Uh, this uh, is uh, possible uh, due to an educational grant provided by um, ACEL Incorporated. Uh, I'm Dr. Katherine Ronahan and joined by my colleague, uh, Nir Huss. Um, here are our disclosures and um, learning objectives. So here what we're looking to do is cover some specific cases that focus on how to address uh, traumatic wounds where we're, it's, we're unable to flap or graft. And we're looking at um, coming up with algorithmic and holistic approaches to how to assess the wound, to breathe the wound, um, choose the appropriate wound device, et cetera. So let's uh, move right along. So we're talking about advanced therapies, as I mentioned, and um, we are focusing on the extracellular matrix technology. But what I would like, uh, what I would suggest you do if you want to get a deep dive into this technology and get an extra CME credit is um, look at this a program that uh, myself and um, uh, a wound nurse practitioner and I did um, in September. So the whole notion is, can we um, regenerate tissue um, and can we engineer tissue? So what we want is after an injury, we want to use a variety of um, um, materials, xenografts or materials within xenograph to end up with site appropriate remodeling rather than scarring. And um, there's, you know, of course, a lot of xenografts and allografts out there, but the entire notion of regenerative medicine and tissue engineering is that you come up with something that the body will recognize, and then there'll be complete device resorption over time, replaced with site-specific uh, new tissue. So that's, that's the ultimate goal. So, and it's important that it's recognized by the body and then resorbed over time rather than uh, just um, a tolerated by the body, if you will. So the urinary bladder matrix in particular um, promotes site-specific tissue remodeling. So there's gonna be new tissue that's gonna be deposited that will uh, mirror the healthy tissue that it is adjacent to. Um, the key characteristics of this material that I, I think uh, set it apart from most other xenographs is the fact that it's a pig bladder. So there's not a bunch of hair or skin or whatever. So the processing um, is particularly gentle. So you're able to remove the cells, the cellular debris, but the ECM proteins are preserved and that's very important because they're biologically active. In addition, this, is, uh, this material has an intact epithelial basement membrane and that, if you will, kind of guides and directs cellular ingrowth. And then finally, uh, particularly unique about this material is that how it modulates the inflammatory response. So it actually promotes an anti-inflammatory pro-remodeling uh, host immune response. So here are just some uh, micrographs of it. You see how the UBM is oriented versus an acellular dermal uh, matrix and, and the fact that we're able, that there's minimal damage to the protein composition and the structure of the ECM uh, is thought to, um, be the reason that uh, there's this kind of positive impact on the host remodeling capacity. It's very thin, it's processed gently, and all of those components um, are preserved. And so it's a, an interesting kind of bimodal scaffold design. It's got the epithelial basement membrane, which is a dense collagen structure. Um, again, that's ideal for epithelial cell attachment, that's here. And then the lamin appropriate is a very open porous uh, uh, layers that uh, is really ideal for cell infiltration, for neovascularization. So at the end of the day, if you have all of these active things available, which you do because uh, all of the collagens and the cell signaling proteins um, are preserved in this material, and in particular, uh, there's uh, collagen 7, which as you know, is an important um, anchoring protein. Uh, to promote uh, re-epithelialization. All right, so this is, an, this is just a quick slide to cover how um, the body reacts to a variety of things, right? So the body will either treat whatever you're implanting by encapsulating it, so it's isolating it, not um, really um, re uh, recognizing it or encouraging any kind of, um, you know, um, it's basically a placeholder, if you will. So 
it's going to encapsulate, you know, much like if you place a port or something. Um, and so there's an encapsulation response and there's an integration response and then there's the site appropriate tissue remodeling response, which you see with the matrix sim or the porcine, uh, in particular, the porcine urinary bladder matrix. So this, that material will completely go away um, over time uh, and there'll be no evidence microscopically uh, that um, there was ever a xenograft present. And that, I tell you, was a little bit difficult to me, for me to wrap my head around. I'm using an incisional hernia work, but it, 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 um, it's, so, it, it's amazingly effective. Um, all right, so as far as the healing and immune response, as I said, um, it will actually encourage uh, M2 subtype macro, macrophage um, recruitment uh, or um, polarization, if you will. Um, the M1 macrophages are important. They help clear the area, but the M2 macrophages are actually anti-inflammatory, promote new tissue deposition, which is uh, what we ultimately want in this scenario. Uh, and again, if you look at a whole list of different xenografts, Sergisys and Matrostam are the only ones that have any one, any um, higher M2 to M1 uh, ratio with the uh, UBM being uh, significantly higher than uh, the Sergisys. So again, at the end of the day, we have an injury. We're looking for site appropriate tissue um, deposition and more of a constructive remodeling, wound healing rather than scarring. All right, I'm quickly going to mention this because I'm going to be uh, talking about these in my cases. So there, that's biologics. Now we want to talk about biomechanics. So um, we have wounds where we have a lot of retraction or tissue loss. So we can use this type of dynamic tension uh, to address those. And um, essentially, uh, you'll see how I'm going to use these in a second. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the adhesive dynamic tissue system, which you'll see I applied at bedside on one patient and in the OR on the other. But it's basically, it allows for a distribution of traction over a large surface area and medialization of uh, skin and soft tissue edges. So it's a gentle but unrelenting dynamic tension. And that's really important. I mean, we can all, all think about the days of retention sutures when you had um, just that static tension um, and it basically ends up, you know, tearing through tissue. In this case, we're using dynamic tension um, and uh, uh, moving tissue in that regard. Okay, so I'm going to jump ahead to the case studies. So the first is a very nice 63-year-old fellow who works in a big, some kind of big um, uh, delivery facility or whatever, and he had this ginormous pallet jack, and he was going up a slope, lost control, the pallet pallet jack rolled over his right calf. Um, he has some medical issues. He's diabetic, hypertension. Uh, this plays into my choice of wound management. Fairly profound chronic venous stasis disease and the BMI 50 plays into, into the, um, my choice of approaching this. So basically in a nutshell, he injured himself on the, the 10th. I um, uh, was rounding on the 11th and actually went ahead with the a bedside installation of the adhesive closure device. I knew that I wanted to utilize porcine urinary bladder matrix on him, so I uh, took him to the OR on the 14th, but I'll explain why I went ahead and put the device on the 11th. The findings in the OR are here. You can see the size of the wound um, with it off tension um, and uh, the fact that it's an oblique, jagged wound. There's, um, and uh, as I suspected, a 10 or 11 centimeters of exposed tibia once the ischemic oblique flap is retracted. Um, and then uh, he actually went home with the device and then returned to the clinic and we removed it on the eighth. So here's the initial wound. I'll just draw your attention to the fact that this is a very oblique wound that extended far to the lateral aspect of the calf. It's in a bad location, the mid portion of the anterior shin. You can see a lot of ischemic, uh, you know, either, uh, permanent, you know, fixed ischemic or variable ischemic changes on that flap. So this is not one that I would want to um, in any way, shape or form attempt an immediate primary closure. So here we have options. You have lots of different options. You can put them in a, use negative pressure, wet to dry dressing, you know, put some cadaver skin, any number of things, right? 
Uh, in this case, and you can also, again, uh, use uh, the adhesive uh, skin closure device. And I chose the combination of the, um, ab uh, the uh, adhesive uh, skin closure and um, the PUBM, which you'll see in a minute. So this is at bedside. I always like to apply IOBand. I prefer to have the device completely on IOBand rather than on the patient's skin directly. So I'll spritz Hollister spray, place the IOBand, and then place the device on top of it. Um, so here you see it. it it's not, it doesn't bother him. It's just, um, it's non-invasive. So just uh, put the device in place and then left it alone. And then that was after a couple, three days, took him to the OR. So now you can get a sense of where the wound is, how honestly how close it is um, to the ankle. I keep forgetting um, it's really not, not that far above the ankle. And so now I've partially deinstalled the device. See, I still have the elastomers over here. So I can fully explore the wound because I wasn't able to do that in the emergency room or at bedside. And it doesn't project well, but this is all exposed tibia. And you see it's a variable depth and thickness of a large ob oblique flap. So what I realized is that I wasn't going to be able to meaningfully close the skin. If I did, it would die. So what I did then is implant a little bit of the micrometrix. That's a single layer of the porcine urinary bladder matrix. It's uh, lyophilized and then ground up. I look at it as immediate release morphine. It has all the elements I was talking about earlier, but it kind of percolates and can get in crevasses and gets the party started, if you will, as far as um, the uh, xenograph and the host chatting. And then you see I put a thin layer, it's a two layer uh, Cytel wound sheet. I cut it, just cut it and place some under the flap and then directly over. Uh, the exposed um, soft tissue in the midline. Then just protected it. You just, it's very easy. You just put adaptic on it. Um, it. It's important. The material is like Goldilocks. So you want to have it perfectly hydrated. It can't be too dry. If it's too dry, it becomes somewhat inert. If it's floating around in fluid, then it's not contacting living tissue. It has to be contacting living tissue. In this case, I knew the wound was pretty moist, so I didn't hydrate it uh, with... Um, the hydrogel, that's the simplest thing to hydrate it with. Um, I simply covered it with adaptic though to protect it. And then um, place some Aquacel AG Hydrofiber Extra there. And then uh, replace the uh, elastomers such that it was again under dynamic tension. And here he is when he comes back on the eighth, he just went home. We told him to, you know, not walk around on it a lot because of the venous stasis disease, elevate the leg when he could. So here he is coming back in on the eighth. Again, I, there were no sutures other than I put a few sutures just to secure the, uh, the Cytel sheets to the, to the surrounding tissue. But as you see, I put no sutures in the skin or anything else. So for all intents and purposes, this is sutureless. So there you can see now uh, what was an ischemic flap. You'll see it better in a second but it's, um, it's very well adherent. Uh, we have no seroma and no evidence of infection. Uh, this, we did not maintain him on antibiotics. And so here it is when we, the device is removed. So this was that huge, and remember there was literally some fixed uh, ischemia along this edge, and this was all, some of it's the chronic venous stasis disease, but, but most of it is just the, the fact that that portion of the flap was ischemic. And now you can see that it's very well uh, everything is very well adherent. There's still uh, the uh, porcine urinary bladder matrix on this portion of the wound and on the adaptic. So I just reapply the same adaptic in that situation. Um, and then at that point, we were adding some uh, hydrogel to maintain the proper hydration. And then uh, here he is on the 22nd. You can see he's continuing to heal and epithelialize. This is on the 23rd. You see now he's got a really nice area of uh, an epithelium and just barely has these tiny little areas that was a little desiccated. That's still probably a little bit of the Cytel um, or the PUBM. So we just hydrated, told him to keep that a little bit hy uh, better hydrated. Now, while all this is going on, um, I don't, I uh, do not allow the patient to shower or get that area of uh, wet because then you would lose the porcine urinary bladder matrix. Okay, so there's the before. Um, and like I said, difficult wound from the location standpoint, 
as well as the patient's BMI, his chronic venous stasis disease, yet uh, we're able to get, a, I think, a really excellent result. I, uh, we continue to follow these over time because they really mature nicely. Like in six months, I would expect him to have mo uh, mobility of this um, over, the, over his shin uh, or over the um, uh, tibia uh, as it, as, because the remodeling process uh, does continue for beyond the time we can see the material. Okay, so uh, here's our 63-year-old fellow with a number of comorbidities, essentially completely healed a, a wound in a very annoying area um, on the anterior shin. Um, we used the porcine urinary bladder matrix to cover the bone and the soft tissue to both accelerate wound healing uh, and encourage, as I said, the site-specific tissue deposition. I also, it is also well documented and well seen that this material, the PUBM also seems to have some antibacterial properties or anti-infectious -infectio properties because um, when, when I implant it, I notice uh, really most often we don't have any uh, surgical site issues and that would certainly be considered a, a contaminated uh, wound that occurred in the workplace. So again, in this case, I'm using we're using biomechanics and biologics to to address this wound in a in a very uh, timely fashion, I think, um, and and a very easy. Fa I mean, the pa patients will walk around all day long with that um, with the Abra uh, adhesive device in place. Uh, they'll take that any day over you know negative pressure or some of the other you know more tethering devices. Okay, so moving along, uh, next is a 27-year-old fellow uh, from Carlsbad. Apparently, Santa came early um, as alleged home invasion, and he sustained a shotgun wound in the right thigh. So you get a sense of the pellet uh, distribution. Um, so again, uh, what do we have uh, for options here? Attempt at primary closure. You guys can tell me if you would want to do that once you see the wound. Uh, wet to dry dressings. He actually initially, uh, my colleague initially put a negative pressure wound therapy device on him and he, he said he couldn't tolerate it. He said it was actually killing him. He, he at one point said, please just cut off my leg instead, um, which is a little high, you know, hyper, a uh, little hyperbole, but whatever. Um, and uh, then we could of course try and skin graft him, get him ready for a skin graft. Again, use cadaver skin, some dermal skin substitute. Uh, xenograft or an adhesive skin closure device or a combination of the above. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be easily, uh, easily labeled as a, a biologic and biomechanics uh, person. Um, so this uh, gentleman went to the OR on the 8th, which is when, as soon as, you know, when he arrived to our institution. And at that time, they debrided and applied the negative pressure wound therapy device. And then he was in such discomfort my colleague asked, hey, can, do you have any other ideas? Can you take a look at this? Would you think this might be um, something we could, uh, you know, use the porcine urinary bladder matrix on? And then so the 10th, uh, we actually applied uh, the adhesive um, skin closure device. And then the 14th, we removed it, uh, implanted the porcine urinary bladder matrix and did a primary closure of the wound. Now, um, I'm using the porcine urinary bladder matrix in that in this regard off label because you're you know you're theoretically not supposed to close a wound but I mean I've used this material now for oh over ten years and um, have had we've had great success with implanting it and closing the wound and you'll hopefully understand in a minute when you see the wound why I thought it important to also uh, provide uh, the opportunity for constructive remodeling. So there, here it is with uh, the wound with the wound back on, and then here you see uh, the actual defect. So it um, looks a little hamburgerish. Um, you can see there's fascia kind of laying around everywhere. And the important thing again is you, this basically, this whole area right here is uh, a full thickness skin graft attached to the, to the lateral thigh. So you can see where it's actually you know, look like fixed ischemia again, and then you've got this gradation of ischemic skin. So I, I did not want to lose um, all of that skin. And there you have a better, a better look at this. We didn't do this. The shotgun did this. 
So what I tried to do first is just take whatever little, we just took whatever little shreds of um, fascia we had and pushed the uh, kind of ground up hamburger muscle back down. Now, obviously we're not closing that. So there's a cavity in the muscle. And then you see the large area of ischemic uh, skin. So uh, we're, you see your measurements here. And then again, um, and you guys can see the dimensions of the measurements. Again, I really cover and protect the skin with Ioban. It works beautifully. Just And I would suggest uh, drying it, drying the skin well, spritzing it with Hollister spray, and then carefully applying the Ioban. And when I do, I completely cover this, and then I just cut, cut, a, cut the Ioban uh, from over the top of the wound. I just cover it with a sponge so it doesn't uh, get fluid all over and under the eye band. And now it's just pretty simple. You just lay these adhesive um, devices just side by side. Um, if you notice, I laid it more lateral. I really wanted to baby that kind of fixed uh, ischemic skin flap area there. But uh, I think, you know, a, a centimeter or whatever works just for, for um, your wound. I think they say, they mention a centimeter, but you see, I, I end up being uh, closer, a little bit closer here and a little bit farther here because I just, don't want the adhesive device on that really uh, ischemic area of skin. So um, simply pack the wound with um, Aquacel AG Hydrofiber Extra, which you see is the silver impregnated hydrophilic material. And, um, and then uh, place the uh, skin edges under dynamic tension. So here we're taking them back to the OR a few days later. I purposely left that in place so you could see. If you look on the left, you see how much the skin has moved in just a few short days. And then um, on the right, you see the, you know, how, how useful the uh, Aquacel, or how useful the hydrophilic silver impregnated dressing is just to keep things dry. So there's another couple of images. And then uh, this was a really hectic night. We were in the middle of a bunch of uh, trauma cases. So I, strangely, because as you can tell, I love to take pictures. I didn't get any pictures of the actual implantation of the porcine urinary bladder matrix. But then I, again, I took micro matrix and filled the cavity, kind of got it in around to where the damaged muscle was, so below the fascia, and then just laid a thin sheet. It was probably a two layer Cytel sheet uh, with, uh, on top of everything. And then we went ahead and cl uh, primarily closed the skin. Um, we sent him home. And unfortunately, he was a no-show for his two-week follow-up for suture removal. We called every number because I really wanted to see how this was looking. And he was seemingly lost to follow-up until literally he randomly showed up. It's my Easter miracle. He randomly showed up the end of uh, April and said, hey, I just thought I'd stop by. And so thankfully, Shirley was around and she took some pictures. But I mean, I think that's a pretty awesome result. And, and I asked him who removed his sutures and um, he apparently uh, Ramboed it. So in spite of him removing his sutures and he couldn't remember what day, I mean, I think this is a pretty phenomenal result. I feel like if I just showed you that picture, the 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 ending of the final picture by if I, you would i would say i wouldn't believe it if someone showed me this and then this that that would be the result but it is um and it's again using the porcine urinary bladder matrix as well as um the biomechanics the dynamic uh tension on the wounds so this fellow to sum it up was already in a negative pressure wound therapy device but was having severe pain he was also unfunded so we we struggle a lot with that because it takes days and days sometimes to get a wound back. But um, I think he would have been in the wound back for a month of Sundays and um, that, you know, since it would have been difficult. So he did have, I think that was, you know, not, not the best choice, although he told us because he couldn't stay on the wound back. And that happens, every, you know, in a certain percentage of patients. I'm sure you all have had that experience. So he's got a significant amount of soft tissue loss and quite a large ischemic flap. I did not think that was conducive to primary closure without utilizing dynamic tension first. So it was pretty fast.
Once we got the adhesive skin closure device applied, we were able to definitively close him in four days. And I, I would say with an amazingly excellent cosmetic result seeing and functional result actually, um, considering what um, we were faced with uh, with his initial presentation. So as Austin Powers would say, it's all about biomechanics and biologics, baby. So with that, I'm gonna turn over the webinar to Dr. Huss. Dr. Huss, take it away. Thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, we're going to discuss now when to consider using advanced therapies. My name is uh, Dr. Nir Huss. I'm a trauma and critical care general surgery surgeon in Delray Beach, Florida, South Florida. So let's start. Okay, so first of all, there are definitely times when obtaining some tissue flaps or grafting coverage provides a suboptimal result. In such a situation, the UBM matrix really provides a nice um, answer to a problem that is quite common. This is a simple example. We'll start from a few case uh, examples from a simple to a more difficult one. Uh, fairly common is um, injuries of uh, the tips of the fingers. Now, provided we have some of the bone left behind, and here you can see that in this uh, black mark that is left behind, there's a, the tip of the bone, about a half of it is left, and provided that some of the nail bed is left behind, we have enough of these mesenchymal cells to then produce um, or to possibly even regenerate some functionality back rather than a simple closure. Standard of care would be to simply amputate the remaining uh, portion or in order to attempt a closure and that's it. Well, that's a suboptimal result. So using uh, ASA UBA matrix, in this case, we used the uh, micro particular material about uh, 20 milligrams each application. Within uh, approximately two months, we're able to achieve essentially a new nail and uh, a new tip of, the, of uh, the finger. Although let's say albeit it's not the same thing as the original, but it definitely beats the alternative. I mean, you can see nicely here, uh, it's the middle finger. You can actually see the mark just to confirm that this is indeed the same finger that uh, as before. It's the same finger that has this uh, U-shape on the proximal aspect of it. Shown in this example is a 30-something year old female uh, that had a traumatic amputation of the tip of her middle finger. Now, standard of care is simply to take some of the bone that is remaining behind. You can see this uh, tip with a black area that is essentially the remainder of a bone. And um, so remove that portion and attempt to gain a closure and call it a day. Now this is a suboptimal result and may even lose an additional um, fingertip all, all the way to the joint. If we can actually re grow or achieve somewhat better while preserving the finger as is, it will be an, a much better and more optimal uh, outcome. If it was my finger, that's what I would expect, if possible. So using UBM matrix, uh, micro particulate material, probably 20 milligrams is what was used here for each application. Over a course of almost two months, provided we have some of the bone left, which we do, and a few of the cells that are belonging to the um, bed of the nail still alive, we are able to regenerate and uh, regrow. And essentially, I'll fast forward to the end result. About two months into it, you can clearly see a fingernail and a tip of a finger presenting here. So obviously, this is a much better result. It's not exactly her normal finger that was lost. Clearly, it's going to be a little bit shorter, but it bears more resemblance to um, the original finger tip rather than just a simple stump, which is the standard of care. This is just another view of the same thing. And again, this is back to failed tissue flaps and or uh, grafting where the UBM matrix gives us another opportunity or possibility to achieve a better functional outcome and a better outcome for the patient. 
In this case, we're now gonna show failed tissue flaps and enhancements of difficult areas to manage surgically with advanced, advancement flaps. It's a synergistic type modality. And by that, I mean, in this example, for example, we have exposed skull and a previously attempted flap placement and about four months into it, it got infected, the flap necrosed, and we're back with a chronic wound that was unable to be managed or closed, and uh, the initial flap attempt failed. This happens to be a father of one of the pulmonary doctors in my hospital. He stopped me in the hallway and said, hey, I heard you guys do some interesting things with uh, A-cell, and uh, would you mind taking a look at my dad? We've been dealing with this for a number of months now. So this is the top of his skull. And I said, sure. Um, essentially what we do is first we do the debridement, get the wound as clean as possible. That's pretty much standard. And then immediately we use the micro particulate material to kind of kickstart the um, process of converting the macrophage type one to macrophage type two activation, which is really the guts of, of uh, the biochemical background, how this thing behaves and, and drives wound healing uh, from one version, which is just deposition of collagen and scar tissue as fast as possible to site appropriate tissue. So we use the microparticulate material, in this case about 100 milligrams, and then a Cytel wound matrix on top, three layers. And this is about two weeks into it. You see some areas of partial incorporation. You see some granulation tissue that is uh, visible. And then we fast forward about a month. Again, seeing the same. And one of the key things I want to point is that the wound looks like it's infected. You see these little, flu a little bit of this snotty looking fluid that is kind of reminiscent of a Pseudomonas aeruginosum type infection, but it's not as green. It doesn't smell the same. It doesn't behave the same. And this is in fact partial incorporation of the UBM matrix. And this is what you would expect. What we need to be comfortable uh, in realizing, doing, and teaching others is not to wipe this milieu off. This is where all the biochemistry happens. This is where the healing process takes place. This is the normal progression of this device as it gets incorporated into the surrounding tissues and um, basically works. So do not wipe it off, which is initially uh, what most people would do when they see that, they would think, oh my God, this looks bad, this looks infected, let's debris it, let's clean it. No, let it be. Treat the patient clinically. If you look around, there's no erythema, there's no edema, there's no increase in uh, temperature, there's no pain associated with this, uh, white count does not go up, it's not infected, just let it be. And this is uh, two months uh, post, clearly we achieved the healing where before they attempted a flap, uh, which has failed, they attempted conservative management, which has failed. Um, and this is one example. Let's go into something a little bit more challenging, which we see a lot in South Florida. And this is sacral decubidae, especially stage three, stage four, sacral decubes on, um, in most cases, it's the elderly population. Now, what I wanna say is that these are horrendous wounds, obviously primarily caused by pressure, on people who are infirmed. And there's no substitution to increasing the um, nutrition and being vigilant as to the pressure points and able to have the right bed and continuously move the patient every hour or two. Without that, including the nutrition, it does not matter what we do, it's not going to work. So a simple flap, which oftentimes we uh, perform uh, augmented with the UBM matrix improves the outcome in our hands and improves the ability for us to resolve this uh, quite common, difficult problem. But I just also wanted to say that we uh, will not forgo the other pillars, which is get an adequate bed, move the patient as much as necessary, and nutrition. Without those three pillars, this is going to fail. But it will enhance the healing. It will help us to achieve adequate um, uh, healing in a timely manner and provide an advantage above and beyond just a simple flap. This is an augmentation to an already standard of care type 
uh, procedure. This is another similar flap formation along with uh, A-cell powder and uh, cytel material laid. This is actually one layer of cytel material laid within the wound to enhance the closure and enhance the healing. I'm going to discuss now similarly, uh, but involving a little bit more difficult traumatic wounds where there are bone exposure. And in that case, this is a 50 something year old male that was involved in a farm accident where his uh, jeans or trousers were caught in a drive shaft of a pump and ultimately ended up to an amputation by the time uh, he has gotten to us. This is basically what we have uh, to work with. So what do we do here? One option is to amputate further and obtain a closure, but functionally you may lose a joint here. It's an issue between having a below the knee amputation and above the amputation, and as much limb as we can have, uh, functionally it will uh, present itself as a better uh, solution for the patient ultimately. So what you see here is uh, we have some tissue that looks again like hamburger meat. This is mostly muscle. There's some bone in there as seen on the previous, you see the tibia showing up. Um, we did obviously reconfigure the tibia and we had to cut the excess, allow the flap to form over it. But we need something to enhance the, the healing here, something to give us a benefit and attempt to preserve as much leg as possible to try to maintain a below knee amputation rather than an above knee amputation on this uh, specific wound. This is also an uncontrolled diabetic, which also increases risks of uh, failure of any type of wound management, increase the risk for an above knee amputation relative to a below knee amputation. So we can use as much help as we can get. And uh, lastly, you can see here is uh, on day one, first we debris the wound, get it ready, try to close whatever we can close with uh, whatever available flap rather than uh, cut things further and try to go towards uh, the knee. I'd like to preserve as much tissue, tissue as possible and use the qualities of the UPM matrix in its form as a microparticulate material. And along with that, um, the Cytel version of this. Uh, in this case, it was a three-layer uh, cytel that was also introduced within the wound to help um, tissue regeneration in a much better way. This is basically two weeks into it. And then we fast forward uh, three and a half weeks approximately. You can see nice granulation tissue. There are areas of the skin, obviously, that were left open. And the result that you would realize as you use this material is that for some people, somehow it helps in regenerating the skin and avoiding a skin graft. On other people, it does not. There's, I don't know what exactly differentiate one person versus the other, but it is something that I've seen time and time again, that in, in a number of instances, and it's quite a lot, I can forgo skin grafting altogether. In others, it, I reach the level of the skin, and at that point, I do do skin grafting because I see that the wound has stalled. And these guys, uh, in particular, I did not require any skin grafting. It actually healed very well, and within a relatively short amount of time, we had a nice uh, below-the-knee stump and a, uh, was fitted later with a prosthesis. Again, this is in an uncontrolled diabetic, and uh, it's a very difficult wound to normally deal with, not a, let alone in an infected type wound that had dirt on it from um, this farm accident. Similarly, but different, this is, uh, I think it was also about a 50 year old male that had his arm outside in a rollover accident of uh, clearly an exposed bone. In this case, this is the um, forearm. You can see it has an external fixator and a significant amount of tissue missing over the bone. So here we're trying to achieve bone coverage and ultimately it's the same thing. Once I achieve the bone coverage, once I, I, I reach a certain level that I'm comfortable with, you can either decide to skin graft or for some reason, for some people, skin will form over it. 
This is about two weeks into it. I used again the microparticular material and the ACL Cytel three layer version of the uh, device. You can see nicely some striated muscles over here. The bone is actually already uh, pretty much uh, achieved the closer over it. This is how the microparticular material looks. And I prefer it always as an initial uh, device placement because it has the highest amount of uh, surface area and it can fit and go in between all the nooks and crannies of the tissue because these tissues are not necessarily flat surfaces and it helps kickstart or begin the formation of uh, again M1 type macrophages to M2 type macrophages. This is the external fixator. As you can see, it's the forearm. We have nice uh, granulation tissue. There's some muscle definition that's gained back. This shows you here the fenestrated uh, three-layer cytel, how it looks like as it was partially incorporated within a period of about a week. This is two weeks post. There's a little bit more tissue uh, growth, but still partial incorporation of the cytel material. Normally what I do in that uh, case when I have partial incorporation, I simply uh, cover back the wound and wait another week and take a look. This can all be done as an outpatient. The patient does not need to stay in a hospital. It's a set it and forget it type technology, which is really nice. There's nothing that the person needs to do. There are no dressing changes at home. Uh, I always tell them the only thing that may happen is it may smell bad. And if it does, if you can tolerate it, that's great. If not, then just take some curlics and then wrap around it and an ace to kind of hide the smell, but it's going to smell. And if it bothers you, then cover it. If it doesn't bother you, that's great, but just don't touch it. So next we show a uh, traumatic injury to the sternum. This was actually from a gunshot wound to the sternum that uh, first, was attempted um, initial simple wound management and closure, which failed, got infected. Uh, and at that point, I was uh, called in to try to help. What you can see here below is actually the heart underneath the, the sternum. And the head, just for orientation, is on the um, bottom of the screen, actually. So this is essentially midpoint of the sternum with an oval shape uh, defect that was debrided in order to achieve adequate and, and viable bone tissue. The problem is that the heart is exposed. So in this issue we dealt with, first of all, uh, we use the microparticular and ASA material. Literally it was laid over the heart. The, um, what you can see here is the, uh, UBM matrix material below the level of the sternum as it was placed deep, and then the sternum over it. First, what we did is simply debride the sternum as you would expect. And when we have nice uh, tissue that looks to be viable without uh, any signs of infection, then we started the reconstruction. And this is what you see right now is the UBM matrix at the bottom, which is essentially laid underneath the sternum. On top of it, we took a cadaveric uh, bone from a pelvis, cut it to size and placed it to bridge the, the sternum. And we used some uh, titanium plates. Over them, we placed, um, again, the UBM matrix and created nice uh, flaps from the left and the right side pectoralis major, closed over it, and that was it. So it was um, a wound that initially failed conservative management, got infected, um, had to be reopened and readdressed, and then easily achieved uh, a closure with the aid of uh, using the UBM matrix. One more case of a traumatic event, another person leaving their hands uh, or arms rather outside the car while the car toppled over in a crash, resulting in a traumatic wound uh, to the forearm, uh, the right of the screen show is the shoulder. The left of the screen is the, um, the hand itself. And you can see the forearm is exposed. It's a dirty wound. There was a lot of road debris. The muscles were completely destroyed all the way to the uh, radius and ulnar. He did not have a fracture of the radius and ulnar somehow, but they were completely exposed. It doesn't really show very well in here, but the uh, extensive muscles of the, the hand were badly damaged. After doing the initial debridement, we started with the UBM matrix. This is 
uh, now the second iteration, so it's actually three weeks into it. And you can see one more time, the nice granulation tissue plus the tissue that you um, I can't reiterate more and say, do not wipe this off. This is simply partially incorporated UBM matrix. As we move along, this is one of those examples where initially I thought I'm gonna to have to do skin grafting, but yet you can see new epithelium starting to form over the granulation tissue as uh, things reached out the level of the rest of the, the arm. Uh, avoiding actually skin grafting altogether. This is a close-up of the same. We are now a month into it, a month and a week, and about a month and uh, two weeks, I'm sorry, a month and three weeks after the injury, there's now actually hypergranulation tissue, which normally when that happens, I just use silver nitrate to take it down. And you see nice forming of uh, new skin. Now, Further, uh, same day, just the other side of the, the arm, you can see all the pink tissue, which is essentially new skin formation, and then complete closure within two months with uh, full functionality back and no requirement for any skin grafting in a very significantly large area. The other uh, nice thing that I wanted to discuss is the fact that, think about the difference between skin graft, especially over um, joints. When you skin graft someone, the skin as it heals becomes rough, it contracts continuously, and if it's a cross joint, it can pose a problem of a continuation of the contraction across the joint, which uh, constricts patient, requires extensive physical therapy, and is a suboptimal outcome. You will see that when you use the UBM matrix, and you can avoid uh, skin grafting in, in many situations such as this, even in a very large traumatic wound, uh, such as we started, the skin that regrows or the tissue is very pliable, doesn't feel fibrotic. It's not the same as when you just allow scar tissue to form where you lose functionality. Uh, in here, you don't, I'm not saying that you gain 100% back of everything that was lost, but it's something less than 100% and definitely something much, much better than skin grafting and all the associated problem with skin grafting that follows skin grafting. Again, this, the contracture of the tissue, the pliability of the tissue, and subcutaneously, it doesn't feel as hard. There's more functionality to the tissue. There's more tissue-specific regeneration rather than just a simple uh, collagen deposition for scar tissue formation to try to wound the heel as much as fast as as fast as possible, which is what evolutionary we are designed to. Once we're injured, heal the wound as fast as possible and, and move on. Uh, I want to move on to just slightly different types of wounds. In this case, these are difficult and complex wounds in the diabetic feet with or without exposed bone. So we'll start with um, a partial amputation of the, the fifth uh, toe along with its uh, metatarsal in a Diabetic, this is a very common problem. I'm sure a lot of you are dealing with who are in wounds, diabetic foot ulcers that ultimately lead to horrendous wounds and to amputation. And it's a very, very difficult problem to deal with. Um, using ACL has revolutionized the way that we deal with those. We use ACL quite a lot. Uh, the key aspect is uh, to find that Goldilocks level as with all usage of uh, the ACL UBM matrix material to find the, the Goldilocks level of having not too dry and not too wet of a wound bed, this you will discover as, as uh, you go along to kind of gauge what type of wound I'm dealing with based on that to design and decide which type of UBM matrix uh, material I will use, meaning how many layers, et cetera. But the rule of thumb is always start with a microparticulate material. And then depending on the type of patient and type of wounds that you're dealing with, you'll decide on how many layers. Here we see partially incorporated three layer of the Cytel material, which is fenestrated. You can see the nice uh, slivers with some granulation tissue behind it. This is another look of the same. This is about uh, two and a half weeks into it. Of course, in a diabetic foot wound, incorporation takes longer. So if in other areas of the body, incorporation may take 10 to 14 days of a three-layer material, and here it may double that. But patience is, is the key, and with time, you will see that you will achieve adequate closure, even in a very difficult um, wounds such as this. And here, within two and a half months, 
we achieve the closure with that requirement again of skin grafting. And um, it's just a very simple um, procedure to deal with because you don't have to use sutures. It's basically you lay it on the wound and you cover it. It can't get any simpler. And then there's no wound dressing that needs to be achieved at home. It's just that you bring the patient as an outpatient every 10 days or so to review the wound. If it's partially incorporated, I just literally just recover it and wait another 10 days. It's kind of like you set it and you forget it. And then when the patient comes back, you take a look at it. Um, when there's a concern for infection, as I said before, look at the patient from a clinical aspect. There's no erythema, there's no edema, there's no white count, there's no fever. The wound is fine. Don't wipe it off. This is a couple months down the road. Nice healing. You lost a toe, but it's also cosmetically even looks good. And again, no skin grafts. I want to switch gears into something different. We're going to discuss necrotizing fasciitis and Fournier's gangrene and the use of the UBM matrix in which. Uh, this is an example of a 34-year-old, uh, again, uncontrolled diabetic female that initially a picture was sent to me uh, saying, hey, we have this uh, problem, and that's kind of what was sent after an initial debridement. I said, okay, go ahead, send her over. Interesting to me from a general surgeon's perspective is the little bubble that you see, which is essentially a direct hernia through the fascia and the inguinal ligament on the left side. Normally, as a general surgeon, we repair those hernias, but we don't really see them in such a manner. So first things first, after the debridement, was to repair the hernia. For hernia repair, we, I use the Gen, Gentrix version, which is an eight-layer version of the UBM matrix material as an underlay and use that as a biological um, mesh to repair the hernia. You can hear that, you can see here that the uh, necrotizing fasciitis is quite extensive and, and progresses all the way to the left lateral aspect to the buttocks of the patient, it extends downwards towards the thigh and uh, the leg, I'm sorry, to the, um, the thigh. And on the medial aspect of the thigh, it actually involved the labia majora, which we had to completely amputate because it was completely necrosed and infected. This is after the repair of the inguinal uh, ligament, about two weeks into it. Again, we use the eight layer Gentrix version uh, of this material, which is the strongest form of the ACEL material. It has eight layers to it, and we performed an underlay repair, a normal inguinal hernia repair. And the rest of the wound, we basically sprinkled uh, the uh, micrometrix, microparticular material. We used five grams in total for this wound. It's quite large. And then Cytel three layers on top. The patient initially stayed for a week and a half in a hospital. And then after that, everything else was done as outpatient. What I wanted to show here is partial incorporation, again, of the material. You see this grayish looking... Um, kind of liquid that one more time do not remove. It's simply partially incorporated. The areas that I see that I don't add any more material. The areas that I have uh, viable granulation tissue, that's where I would add more of the micrometrics and more of the Cytel and then send the patient out, bring him back in about 10 days for another um, review and possible addition of material. In here, you see a complete incorporation. In this case, we will cover the whole wound again with the uh, A-cell micrometrix and Cytel material, going about a month into the wound right now. So basically, this is going to be now the third incorporation, the third edition of um, the micrometrix and the Cytel sheets. This is just another closer look of the same thing. This is the uh, uh, zoom area of the inguinal hernia that used to be there and it's now completely covered with granulation tissue. And as we move forward about two and a half months at uh, the three month uh, mark, we almost gained complete coverage. And then at four months, we were essentially done with the wound. No skin grafting, no um, large flaps required, just very simple management of you set it, you place the material, you forget it, you send the patient out. In this case, she went to a nursing home and then returned every 10 days as an outpatient. Thank you very much, guys, for your attention. And uh, we're opening up the forum right now for any questions that you may have. I'll be more than happy to answer. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining Dr. Hassan and I for this webinar 
Uh, we have a lot of questions, actually. So I want to run through. We don't have a lot of time. I want to run through a few and then I'm um, going to lob a few to Dr. Huss. So first question that a lot of people are asking is, is this material, the PUBM, uh, only covered in the OR or can it be applied in an outpatient wound center? It can absolutely be applied in outpatient wound centers. I think there's a number of wound centers that have the material available and also in outpatient surgery facilities. So um, definitely uh, there are outpatient options for utilizing the material. And then the second most asked question is, how did you manage the venous congestion in the lower extremity wound, especially given his size and underlying venous disease? So uh, I, we kept him, while he had the um, ABRA adhesive on, we kept him um, ACE wrapped uh, because we need access to it. And then as soon as we deinstalled the device and uh, just were waiting for the ACE cell to, I mean, for the PUBM to, you know, uh, for the wound to completely heal, uh, we put him back actually in his compression uh, stockings. But he had never had a, any type of evaluation. So he has been referred to a, a vascular surgeon for a venous evaluation to see if there's anything treatable. Um, and then there uh, was a question about why not wrap the first case in Pro4 after ACEL. And that's a very good point. I actually will use not only Unaboots, Pro4, Total Contact Casting, uh, that those will protect the material very well and offload or provide the compression you need. But he already had um, the compression, his compression hose. So we just put him back in that. And there was a question about, would this be appropriate in burns? Absolutely. They have a whole burn line. We can get into that in more detail. And I'm sure Dr. Huss can speak to that as well. And then there was another question, does UBM uh, get applied more than once in the OR? Yes, you can apply it as frequently as you need. And in some of Dr. Huss's wounds, I'm sure the huge wounds, I'm sure he was applying it um, more than once. And uh, there was also a question about, can it be obtained and reimbursed in skilled nursing home care and assisted living? That I'm not sure. Most LTACs cover it. Um, but yeah, it's easily applied at bedside. So I think you'd probably have to just uh, speak to the facility. And um, Dr. Huss, I'm going to ask you to comment on a little bit more on, uh, is it appropriate to use in burns? And when do you decide between using negative pressure uh, versus a flap? And um, how, you, um, how you tell the difference between uh, slough slash biofilm uh, versus residual UBM matrix? And I will say one very quick thing that is, um, I just don't see biofilm so much and I, I, with, with the PUBM in place. And then um, there's also somebody saying after the presentation, could you advise in a difficult case? So I'm sure we can um, get, you, get you hooked up with this uh, individual in a little bit. So take it away, Dr. Huss. Okay, hey guys. Um, so let me start with the first question about the um, flap versus wound back. The way I would approach it is I would uh, use one or the other, I mean, depending on the patient, depending on the person that uh, and the availability of the skills of the surgeon. Um, if let's say you need a plastic surgeon in order to do a flap, um, then maybe you're not uh, able to have the one, I would obviously go with the wound back. Otherwise, the UBM matrix is always a viable option. Um, although technically, according to FDA, we're not supposed to put it under a wound back device, but uh, have not used flaps almost, I would say very rarely, I should say, I've re resorted ultimately to use a flap, even in large wounds and large areas, because the UBM matrix affords a solution that is much simpler. It, it works. Uh, it's better ultimately for the patient because it's less surgery. It's a type of a product that uh, you lay it. It's a much simpler solution. The patient like it. Um, it. I would prefer it over a flap always if I can. So if I have the option, I would always avoid a flap. Uh, wound vac is kind of like um, an option that I use when I want to set something away that nobody touches. I don't use currently wound vac over my uh, A-cell uh, UBM matrix. So... 
again, to answer the question, it really depends on the situation and on the comfort level of the surgeon and the type of patient and obviously the size of the wound. As far as burns, uh, we definitely use ACL on burns, although back to FDA indications, it's not indicated for anything for a third degree burn, although off-label used it and it works very well. But uh, technically, based on FDA indication, it's not indicated for a third degree burn. For certainly for a second degree burn, uh, we have used it and it works great. It works well um, as far as uh, biofilm versus sloth versus some sort of an infection process going on. A-cell uh, UBA matrix has been shown in, um, in both in vivo actually, but ex vivo to have some biological activity or antimicrobial activity, I should say. And then moreover, you basically treat the patient clinically. If they don't have a fever, if there's no white count, if uh, the area surrounding the wound doesn't look erythematous or angry, or you don't have a concern, the wound is really badly infected, then it's not. Plus, um, as Catherine said, I don't really see biofilms since start using this uh, product, which is really by far the number one reason why I don't have to deal with this. I just don't see it. And then on top of that, you would, as you use the product, you will realize the difference between the way that the product disintegrates and an infectious type process. Initially, it may be a little bit confusing, but believe me, after you do a few, it will be very clear to you when you see partial incorporation of the wound, of the product in the wound, I should say. So I think we might be out of time. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. Hmm. Um, or I don't know, I guess keep going. I don't know. Can't tell. I would keep going. <laughs> so they tell me, keep going. Yeah. So, so your point is flap, you know, th there's a combination of things. You might use a, a wound vac initially and you might, you will transition to some porcine urinary bladder matrix. And then in some scenarios, there might be a flap in there at some point. It just really depends on the wound. Yeah. I, I personally have been shocked at the you know, coverage that you get just with the porcine urinary bladder matrix and how quickly it'll take a big three-dimensional wound and make it almost two-dimensional. Okay. Okay.